Hello students, uh, I'm Dr. Gayatri and today we are going to discuss about some disorders in the renal system. So at the end of this uh, session, you all should be able to identify the main reasons for renal failure and also you should be able to describe about some renal disorders like pyelonephritis, glomerulonephritis and nephrotic syndrome. And also, you should have an idea about the nursing management of different renal disorders. Now, first of all, we are going to uh, look at a condition that affects the kidney known as pyelonephritis. So, if you look at this picture, it's an ultrasound scan that shows an enlarged kidney. And uh, this is a picture that shows what happens to the kidneys in pyelonephritis. So you can see there are inflammatory areas, areas where there is inflammation in the kidney and also there are pus filled areas in the kidney. And apart from that, you can also see this inflammation has healed by fibrosis and that is why there is scarring of the kidney. So all these complications to occur together will occur in a condition called pyelonephritis. So first of all, we are going to discuss about this pyelonephritis. So this is what happens to your kidneys in pyelonephritis. The kidneys become inflamed. So there is localized areas of inflammation in the kidney. There is localized accumulation of pus in different parts of the kidney. And at the same time, this inflammation will heal by fibrosis, leaving scar tissues in the kidney. So, pyelonephritis therefore is an infection or inflammation of the kidney. So, this includes uh, the kidney tissues or the kidney parenchyma as well as the renal pelvis, the part of the kidney where all these renal tubules open into the ureter that is called renal pelvis. So, this pyelonephritis can affect the kidney tissues as well as tissues in the renal pelvis. Now most of the time this pyelonephritis is caused by microorganisms like E. coli, staphylococcus and streptococcus and these bacteria can get into the kidney from various sources. So sometimes it is by ascending urinary tract infection that is uh, these microorganisms can enter into the urethra and through the urethra, it can ascend up, up and up until it reaches the kidney and can cause this infection. Or in some other cases, these microorganisms, they have been there in the blood. So from the blood, uh, the microorganisms, when blood flows into the kidneys, these microorganisms can get into your kidneys and can cause the infection. So this is the etiology of pyelonephritis. So it could be due to ascending urinary tract infection. Most of the time, uh, the microorganisms will enter through the urethra and will ascend upwards until it reaches the kidney. And in the kidney, it will cause the infection. The other thing is ureterovesical reflex. Now, when I did pediatric surgical disorders, I have told you ureterovesical reflex, uh, uh, ureterovesical uh, reflex, ureterovesical reflex is a functional abnormality uh, that can increase the risk of urinary tract infections. So here what happens is uh, there is now normally the urine has to flow from above downwards that is from the kidneys to the ureters, from the ureters to the ureter bladder and from there uh, along the urethra, the urine will pass out. But in ureterovesical reflex, what happens is uh, there is backflow of urine from the ureter upwards. So it's a functional abnormality and this also can cause infectants to progress from the ureter upwards until the kidney and can cause infection in the kidney. Next, the urinary tract obstructions. Now, they can be due to stones. So, these stones causing urinary tract obstruction are called urinary calculi. So, urinary calculi, tumors, 
then narrowing of uh, different parts of the urinary system that is strictures so all of them increase the risk of pyelonephritis so if you look at this picture this shows ascending urinary tract infection one of the ways in which pyelonephritis can occur so you can see the organisms like e coli now e coli is a coliform organism so e coli is mostly found in feces so uh, now the anal orifice and the urethral orifice these are in close proximity especially in females and therefore from the anal area these e coli can uh, reach the urethra and from there they can ascend upwards until they reach the kidneys and can cause infection in the kidney so this is ascending urinary tract infection causing pyelonephritis now if you look at this picture this shows vesicourethral reflux or ureteral uh, uh, vesicle reflux now this is in a normal person the urine flows from the kidneys down the ureters up to the urinary bladder so in the urinary bladder the urine is stored and once a proper time comes the urine is excreted through the urethra so that is in a normal person but in but in uh, ureteral vesicle reflex what happens is now if you look at if you follow these arrows you will see the arrows are directed upwards so that means from the vesicle that is from the bladder the urine flows upwards and this urine together with this urine the infectants these microorganisms can also spread upwards to reach the kidney and in the kidney they can cause infection so this is how vesicourethral reflux or ureteral vesicle reflux predisposes to pyelonephritis now look at this picture this shows urinary calculi so urinary calculi can occur in the kidney in the renal pelvis or uh, in the uh, kidney tubules or in the ureter so anywhere in the urinary system so when you have urinary calculi in any part of the urinary system what can happen is the urine flow gets obstructed so when urine is uh, uh, when urine stays in one place for a long time the microorganisms can proliferate there and can cause infection so that is how urinary calculi cause pyelonephritis okay so here are the symptoms of pyelonephritis now uh, not like ordinary urinary tract infections now usually in day-to-day -day life we call the lower urinary tract infections as uti or urinary tract infections so most of the time they present with symptoms like dysuria that is burning pain during micturition during urination then there will be increased frequency of urination urgency of urination and uh, pelvic and suprapubic pain lower abdominal pain and suprapubic pain most of the time but people usually don't get fever nausea and vomiting and back pain but when it comes to pyelonephritis that is infl inflammation of the kidneys the patients are toxic they are very ill with very high fever with chills there will be severe pain in the kidney kidney region that is in the flanks or in the loin and at the same time they will have nausea and vomiting increased frequency of urination dysuria and discoloration of their urine so these are the clinical manifestations in pyelonephritis so there will be high fever with chills and rigors there will be flank pain or loin pain dysuria that is pain or burning sensation during urination there will be uh, increased urgency to pass urine and at the same time the number of uh, uh, times they urinate will also increase that is frequencies increase the urine they pass will be cloudy dark in color that is they will be bloody and also they will be foul smelling there will be nausea vomiting headache and muscle pain so these are the symptoms of pyelonephritis so remember not like lower urinary tract infections or commonly called urinary tract infection the pyelonephritis is a very serious condition where the patients are usually uh, very toxic they are highly they have high fever 
and uh, chill sometimes. Now, this is the diagnostic assessment. So, for any disease, diagnosis is based, is based on history, physical examination findings, and supported investigations. So, here the clinical history includes the symptoms. Physical examination findings, these are the signs which you try to elicit in these patients. And what are the investigations? You can do certain urine tests like urine full report, urine for culture and antibiotic sensitivity test, and then certain blood tests like blood for urea and, cre uh, blood urea and serum electrolytes, blood culture and antibiotic sensitivity, full blood count, random blood sugar, and then some imaging studies. So these imaging studies could be plain or could be uh, contrast studies. For example, plain X-rays of the kidney ureter bladder region or intravenous pyelogram, which is a contrast X-ray. And at the same time, ultrasound scans are also useful. So ultrasound scan of the uh, abdomen and pelvis, that is kidney ureter bladder region, will help you to give an idea about the condition in the kidneys. Now we'll see the management of pyelonephritis. So if it is any obstruction or any stricture or any uh, uh, ureterobicycle reflux, it cannot be treated with drugs. So always it, the defect has to be corrected by surgery. <coughs> Here in pyelonephritis, since the patient is ill, he has a large amount of microorganisms in their body, these microorganisms have to be eliminated or otherwise uh, the patient can develop further infection or this infection can progress further. So to do that you have to administer antibiotics. So that is called the medical management of pyelonephritis. So what are the antibiotics you are going to give? You have to give antibiotics IV for the initial period. For 3 to 5 days it will be IV antibiotics and then it can be followed by oral antibiotics. But you can't be stopping this antibiotic course within a short period of time. So since it's a serious condition, you will have to continue these antibiotics for about two to four weeks. And apart from that, generally, you give painkillers or analgesics to relieve the pain. You have to encourage the patients to take enough of water to flush out uh, the microorganisms as well as small calculi is left behind. and. Uh, you have to uh, advise the patient to drink water as well as urinate frequently in order to flush out these microorganisms and the uh, calculi, which are smaller in size. So this is surgery to correct uh, the underlying etiology. Now here you can see how the stones are being removed. And then you have to give antibiotics to prevent for the progression of pyelonephritis and at the same time you have to encourage drinking of more water as well as frequent passing of urine. Now we'll see the complications of pyelonephritis. So main complication is scarring of the kidney. This is especially dangerous if it occurs in growing kidneys in children less than two years of age. Then Pyelonephritis can lead to acute kidney shutdown or acute renal failure, urosepsis, severe infection. Now this is renal scarring. You can see this is a normal kidney, how a normal kidney would look like. And this is a scarred kidney. That is when there had been severe inflammation in the kidney and this inflammation has healed by fibrosis, the kidney becomes scarred. So this scarring of kidney is very dangerous if it occurs in smaller kids less than two years of age because at during this time the kidneys are still growing so if the growing kidneys are affected it can give rise to a lot of long-term complications including hypertension so that is why uh, this renal scarring is dangerous okay so now we are going to discuss. So that was about pyelonephritis. Next we are going to 
look at some disease conditions that affect the glomerulus or the glomerular capillary plexus in the kidneys. So first of all, you have to know about the nephron. So what is nephron? Nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. So how many nephrons do we have? In each kidney, we have about 1 million nephrons. So in both the kidneys, we have about 2 million nephrons. Now if you look at this, this is a kidney. And look at this structure, this is a nephron. So what are the parts of the nephron? We have the Bowman's capsule and then the Bowman's capsule opens into the kidney tubules. So you have the proximal convoluted tubules, Dupont Henle, distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts. So inside the Bowman's capsule, there is a capillary plexus. This is called the glomerulus or the glomerular capillary plexus. Then surrounding the kidney tubules, you have another capillary plexus. What is that? That is the peritubular capillary plexus. So we are going to now discuss some disease conditions affecting the glomerulus or the glomerular capillary plexus you find inside the Bowman's capsule. So what is the function of this glomerulus? When blood enters into the glomerulus through the renal artery, this glomerulus filters this blood and so that all the blood except the red blood cells and the proteins get filtered into the Bowman's space and from there it enters into the kidney tubules and take part in urine formation. So therefore the function of the glomerulus is filtration of blood in order to produce urine. So now this is that. You can see here inside the Bowman's capsule you have the glomerulus and the function of the glomerulus is to filter blood into Bowman's space. So remember all the blood except the plasma proteins and the red blood cells get filtered in the glomerulus into the Bowman's capsule and then it passes when it passes along the kidney tubules this is called filtration and uh, then when this filtered blood passes along the kidney tubules certain substances in this uh, in this glomerular filtrate is reabsorbed into the capillaries that surround the tubules this is called reabsorption for example glucose and water and also some electrolytes. Then certain substances that are there in this blood are secreted into the kidney tubules. So this is called secretion and at the end filtration plus secretion minus reabsorption is what you get at the urine excretion. So excretion equals filtration plus secretion minus reabsorption. Now look at this. Filtration takes place in the glomerulus. So look at this structure. This is the Bowman's capsule and this is the glomerulus where this filtration takes place. And this is the structure of the glomerular filtration membrane. So it has got, now these are all blood vessels. This glomerulus is a capillary plexus. So capillaries are blood vessels. Therefore it has got an endothelium, the epithelial lining. Then it has got the glomerular capillary basement membrane. So then it has got a podocytic layer. So these are the podocytes. So these podocytes are not fused with one another. You can see there are gaps in between. So these are called filtration slits. So through the filtration slits from the blood, substances get filtered into the Bowman's space. And uh, these podocytes are negatively charged. So we know the plasma proteins are also proteins. They have got an amine group. Therefore, they are also negatively charged. So two negatively charged particles, will they be attracted to one another or will there be a repulsion? There will be a repulsion. And therefore, uh, the proteins in blood do not get filtered in the glomerulus in a normal person. So that is why in a normal person the urine does not contain any proteins. And at the same time these filtration slits are so small that they can't filter blood cells. And that is why in a normal person the urine does not contain any 
blood cells. Now we are going to look at a condition called pyelonef uh, sorry, glomerulonephritis. So we'll see what that is. So this is glomerulonephritis. So glomerulonephritis is a non-infectious inflammation of the glomerulus or the glomerular capillary plexus and the small blood vessels in the kidney. So why do we call it non-infectious? Because it is co caused by antigen antibody complexes and not by infection. So there is there are formation of antigen antibody complexes. So these antigen antibody complexes or immune complexes when they try to filter in the glomerulus they damage the glomerulus and mediate inflammation. So this condition is what you call glomerulonephritis. So people with glomerulonephritis will can present with hematuria that is there will be dark color urine due to passage of red cells in urine. Why is that? Now in glomerulonephritis when the glomerulus is damaged the red blood cells are filtered in the glomerulus and they are excreted in urine. So that is why the urine appears to be dark in color. Then they can pass proteins in urine. Why is that? Because once again when the filtration membrane is damaged the proteins can get filtered. So that is why there will be proteins in urine. This is called proteinuria. And because of proteinuria they can develop a nephrotic syndrome like picture. So we will be discussing about nephrotic syndrome later in this chapter. So you will get to know what is nephrotic syndrome. And at the same time uh, they can develop nephritic picture also. Finally, it can result in renal failure. So this renal failure could be acute kidney shutdown or it could be chronic renal failure. So now we'll see the pathological patterns of glomerulonephritis. So it's of two types, non-proliferative type where the cell number is reduced. Example is nephrotic syndrome. The other one is proliferative type where the glomerulus becomes hypercellular. Example is nephritic syndrome. So this nephritic syndrome can progress up to end stage renal failure. Right. So now we'll see the causes for glomerulonephritis. Most of the time it's due to kidney causes. Or sometimes this glomerulonephritis, this antigen antibody complex formation that damages the glomerulus could be secondary to some infections. Uh, due to certain drugs, nephrotoxic drugs, that is certain drugs that are toxic to the kidney which you take uh, as medication maybe for some other illness or it could be due to some uh, other diseases like systemic lupus erythematosus or sometimes this may also occur in certain cancers. So this is what happens in glomerulonephritis. So there is immunopathogenesis, that is there is formation of immune complexes or antigen antibody complexes. So these antigen antibody complexes, when they try to filter in the glomerulus, it mediates inflammation in the glomeruli. So this inflammation, it can either resolute, it can result in fibrous tissue formation, or that is it can resolute without fibrous tissue formation, it can resolute with fibrous tissue formation causing scarring of the area or this inflammation can progress further up to renal failure. So these are the possibilities when there is glomerulonephritis. So now we'll see how glomerulonephritis is diagnosed. So diagnosis is based on history that is symptoms physical examination findings, that is signs and certain supportive investigations you request. So first of all, we'll see the symptoms and signs. So symptoms, what are they? There will be edema. Most, it's a generalized edema. It affects all parts of the body, but it is mostly seen in hands, feet, ab abdomen, as well as in face. Then hematuria, that is dark color urine due to presence of red blood cells. 
then there will be proteinuria. So when there's protein in urine, the urine will become frothy or it will be foamy in appearance. Then what are the signs? There will be, if you measure the BP, it will be high. And if you uh, check the lungs with a stethoscope, you will hear abnormal crackling sounds or abnormal wheezes due to presence of fluid in the pleural spaces. That is pleural effusion. And if you auscultate the heart with a stethoscope you will hear abnormal heart sounds that is due to heart failure so these are the signs and symptoms of glomerulonephritis now look at this this is foamy urine or frothy urine due to presence of proteins this is called proteinuria and if you look at this you can see this is in a normal person oh sorry this is microscopic hematuria that is red cells are present in when when there's passing of blood in urine the condition is called hematuria right so sometimes hematuria there may be red cells in urine which cannot be seen by the naked eye so this is called microscopic hematuria with the naked eye you can't see any color changes but if you examine this urine under microscope you will observe red blood cells so this is microscopic hematuria now sometimes when the amount of red cells passed in urine is very high this may give rise to a dark color in urine so this is called gross hematuria so when there's gross hematuria the urine will appear dark in color so then you can see it with your naked eye so in glomerulonephritis depending on the uh, severity of the illness it could be microscopic hematuria or it could be gross hematuria right so here are the diagnostic investigations so you do a complete blood count then renal function tests and kidney biopsy so kidney biopsy is the most confirmatory diagnostic test so if you look at this picture because it shows the exact uh, pathology of the disease so if you look at this picture this shows how the biopsy needle is inserted in order to obtain uh, kidney tissues for biopsy so now we will see the treatment of glomerulonephritis. So first of all, the underlying cause has to be treated. It has to be found out by doing certain investigations and has to be treated. Apart from that, since this is an immune mediated condition, you have to suppress the patient's immunity to prevent further progression of the disease. So this is done by administering immunosuppressant drugs like azithioprines and cyclophosphamide. Then plasmapheresis. So plasmapheresis is to remove the patient's uh, pathological in, uh, antigen antibody complex containing plasma and to replace it with uh, Rh negative, uh, what do you call, purified plasma. So that's plasmapheresis, filtration of plasma. Next, you have to closely observe the patient for development of any signs suggestive of renal failure next dialysis so dialysis is where the blood is taken out of the body it's allowed to pass through a dialyzer or an artificial kidney that filters all the uh, waste and immune complexes and the pure blood or uh, purified blood is circulated back to the patient's body so dialysis could be hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. If all these fail, the final treatment option is to go for kidney transplantation. So this is dialysis. There are two types of dialysis. This is hemodialysis and this is peritoneal dialysis. So look at this. Kidney transplant is the last option. That is, you remove the patient's affected kidney and you replace the patient and you replace that removed kidney with uh, an ABO and RH compatible as well as HLA compatible kidney uh, collected from a donor. This is hemodialysis. See, blood is taken from the arm. You create a fistula. From there, the blood is taken. Blood is sent through a dialyzer. Now, this machine is called a dialyzer. So, dialysis acts as an artificial kidney. So, the blood is purified 
all the waste products unwanted pathological immune complexes all of them are removed and purified blood is then sent back to the patient's body so this is hemodialysis now in peritoneal dialysis what happens is you insert the tubing into the peritoneal cavity uh, you also administer a dialysate now dialysate is a substance that can absorb all the waste material so all the waste through the peritoneum enters into the dialyzer so then this dialysate is removed from the body so that is how the peritoneal dialysis is carried out so what are the complications of glomerulonephritis one thing is congestive cardiac failure pulmonary edema hyperkalemia that is electrolyte imbalances hyperkalemia is when there's excess potassium because the kidneys become unable to regulate uh, the potassium excretion urosepsis renal failure this could be acute or long term and end stage renal disease so nursing management in glomerular nephritis you have to manage edema so to do that you have to maintain the fluid intake output chart you have to restrict the patient's fluid intake to urine output of the previous day plus 500 milliliters of water then you have to assess and have a record of the patient's body weight and at the same time in order to relieve edema you may want to administer and uh, diuretics like fruzimide you have to reduce the salt intake because the patients are already hypertensive and you have to observe the patient closely for complications like congestive cardiac failure and pulmonary edema next you have to look for signs of infection so to overcome this problem of infections you have to follow aseptic precautions during all procedures and at the same time you have to uh, look for any signs of infection in the patient next the patient has to be educated about how to live a healthy lifestyle what type of diet to be taken what type of exercises to indulge in as well as about disease prevention and you have to uh, pay attention and how why uh, paying early attention to any infections is also uh, important to be taught to the patient so this is the nursing management now we are going to look at the condition called nephrotic syndrome so what is nephrotic syndrome now nephrotic syndrome is a condition where the podocytes if you remember the glomerular filtration membrane which i showed you it has got the epithelial cells the basement membrane and then the podocytes now in glomerular nephritis the basement membrane was affected there was inflammation when the uh, mediated when uh, when the antigen antibody complexes try to pass through this filtration membrane now in nephrotic syndrome what happens is the podocytes are damaged so i have told you the podocytes are negatively charged therefore when there's presence of these podocytes in presence of podocytes the proteins which are also negatively charged are not filtered in the glomerulus so when there's podocytes damaged in in uh, nephrotic syndrome what happens is the proteins are excreted in urine so nephrotic syndrome is therefore characterized by four features so there is hyperproteinuria that is increased loss of proteins in urine so in plasma we have different types of plasma proteins majority of these plasma proteins are albumin so therefore the protein that is mostly excreted in urine that is also albumin so there is hyper albuminuria so when the person loses albumin in urine what happens is in blood the albumin level is reduced that is there is hypoalbuminemia in blood then there is hyperlipidemia that's because when the plasma protein level is low the kid, uh, the liver tries to compensate this by producing proteins so the liver produces these proteins as lipoproteins so when these lipoproteins dissociate into lipids and proteins the blood lipid level increases so that is why there is hyperlipidemia and at the same time there can be edema why 
because plasma proteins help to retain blood inside blood vessels. So when there is increased loss of proteins from blood, what happens is uh, the blood cannot be retained inside the blood vessels because the plasma oncotic pressure is not maintained. So this makes the blood or this makes this fluid uh, the fluid portion of the blood to leak from the blood vessels to tissue spaces causing edema. So these are the features of nephrotic syndrome. Now if you look at this picture this explains the entire path pathology of the nephrotic syndrome. So due to damage to the podocytes in the glomerulus there is no repulsion for the plasma proteins. So plasma proteins mostly the albumins are excreted in the they're filtered in the glomerulus and they're excreted in urine so in blood there is in urine there is albumin that is there's albuminuria at the same time in blood the albumin level is reduced there is hypoalbuminemia so albumin is important to maintain plasma oncotic pressure to maintain the pressure that helps to retain blood inside the blood vessels. So when this plasma oncotic pressure is not maintained, what happens is the fluid portion of blood. Now 90% of blood is water. So when this plasma, plasma oncotic pressure is not maintained, this water, the fluid portion in uh, blood leaks out of the blood vessels and enter into tissue spaces causing edema. And at the same time there are other mechanisms also that take place in our body which can contribute to edema. So in blood when there is hypoalbuminemia or uh, reduced amount of plasma proteins, the liver tries to compensate by producing more proteins. So liver produces proteins in the form of lipoproteins which is a combination of lipids with proteins. So when these lipoproteins dissociate into lipids and proteins, the lipid level in blood increases. This is what you call hyperlipidemia. So now we'll see how nephrotic syndrome is diagnosed. It's diagnosed based on history, that is symptoms, physical examination findings, that is signs and investigation findings. So first we'll look at the signs and symptoms. So there'll be edema. So edema is more prominent in the face. Uh, so it mostly appears as uh, puffiness of the face around the eyes. So if you look at these pictures, you can see that. Now, why have I given pictures of children? That's because the nephrotic syndrome, it usually is a disease most commonly seen in preschool children between 3 to 5 years of age. Then, since the patient passes proteins in urine, the urine appears foamy or frothy in appearance. So this is due to protein urea. Then there will be pitting edema of the feet. And uh, there is accumulated. Now this edema is generalized. It occurs in all parts of the body. So it can be in the face, legs, pleural cavity, uh, in lungs, everywhere. So uh, in the pleural cavity when fluid accumulates, it causes pleural effusion and in the peritoneal cavity when this fluid accumulates it causes ascites. Now what are the investigations? So you have to do a 24 hour urine sample for proteinuria. Then you can check the plasma albumin level. You can check the blood lipids. You can do renal function tests like blood urea and serum creatinine. And if the uh, underlying cause is not clear, you will have to go for investigations like kidney biopsy and autoimmune markers. Now this is how nephrotic syndrome is treated. So the goal of nephrotic syndrome is to help the kidneys to function in a normal way again and at the same time to remove excess fluid that gets accumulated in the body that is to relieve edema and also to remove the waste products that gets accumulated in the body due to dysfunctioning of the kidneys. So here are the general measures. You have to 
monitor the patient's fluid intake and output you have to restrict the water intake because there is whatever the patient takes leaks out into the tissue spaces causing edema so you have to restrict fluids you have to assess the kidney functions by doing tests like blood urea serum creatinine and glomerular filtration rate and at the same time you have to look for infections and other complications and you have to treat them accordingly that is not enough you have to find out the etiology the cause for nephrotic syndrome and the cause has to be treated accordingly at the same time to prevent recurrence of nephrotic syndrome the patient has to be kept immunosuppressed so this is done by administering immunosuppressants like pregnisolone and also you have to keep the patient's blood pressure and blood sugar under control because they also can cause further kidney damage. So here are the dietary recommendations for patients with nephrotic syndrome. You have to reduce the salt intake to 1000 to 2000 milligrams per day. Since uh, there is a problem of protein excretion in urine, you have to encourage the patients to take high uh, animal protein containing diet you have to advise the patients to cut down their saturated fat or animal fat intake you should encourage them to take more plant fat you should encourage them to reduce uh, fat containing food including uh, all these desserts and uh, sweet stuff and you should encourage these patients to take more fruits and vegetables and you have to monitor their fluid intake and fluid output right so now we'll see the complications of nephrotic syndrome one is venous thrombosis so why is that venous thrombosis is due to uh, excretion of the protein antithrombin 3 in urine then there's increased chance of infection. Why? Immunoglobulins, which are also proteins, are excreted in urine. So that is why the patients become more prone to suffer from infection. Acute renal failure. Why? When due to edema in the tissues, all the fluid is now in the tissue spaces. So inside the blood vessels, the blood volume is low. So when the blood volume is low inside the circulatory system, what happens is the blood flow to all the organs get reduced. So similarly, the blood flow to the kidney also reduces. So when the blood flow to the kidney reduces, it can cause the kidneys to shut down. So this is called acute kidney shutdown or acute renal failure. The next complication is pulmonary edema. Why? Because the fluids can get uh, can leak out into the lung tissues so this can cause shortness of breath as well as hypoxia so these are the complications of uh, nephrotic syndrome so now we'll see the nursing management in nephrotic syndrome so you have to control edema you have to detect signs of infection and at the same time you have to uh, reassure the patient and the family about this patient's condition and how the symptoms could be kept under control. Next, we are going to look at a condition called lupus nephritis, a condition where the kidneys are affected in a systemic illness called SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. So SLE is an autoimmune disease that affects a lot of body organs in the human body. So one organ that is affected in SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus is the kidney. So when the kidney is affected in systemic lupus erythematosus, this is called lupus nephritis. So the incidence of lupus nephritis is 3 in 10,000 people. And this could be mild to severe. So here also the problem is damage to the glomeruli. Now, in more than 90% of people with SLE, the kidneys are involved. But only 3% of these people will develop 
kidney damage that requires treatment. So now we'll see the pathophysiology of lupal nephritis. So this is what happens in SLE. There's formation of antibodies. It's an autoimmune disease, so there's formation of autoantibodies. So when these antigen antibody complexes or these immune complexes try to filter in the glomerulus, they get deposited in the glomerulus and mediate inflammation. So how is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed based on history, that is symptoms, physical examination findings, that is sign, and then the investigations. So first we'll see the signs and symptoms. So here are the symptoms. There will be hematuria. Now when the glomerulus is damaged, the red cells are excreted in urine. So urine becomes dark in color. There will be flank pain or pain in the uh, loin where the kidneys are located. There will be foamy or frothy appearance of urine due to presence of proteins in urine. There will be headache, dizziness, visual disturbances. These are the symptoms. And what are the signs? When you check the patient's BP, it will be high. If you check the patient's weight, you will see the weight is increased. And there will be edema. So edema could be present in the form of azitis, pleural effusion, pericardial effusion. So what are the diagnostic investigations? So you have to investigate the renal functions in SLE patients by doing renal function tests like blood urea nitrogen and serum creatinine. Then you have to do a urine analysis and at the same time you have to check uh, spot tests for protein and creatinine. 24 hour uh, urine sample for creatinine clearance and protein excretion. Next you have to do tests to diagnose SLE. So to do that here are the tests. You have to check the antibodies uh, against DSDNA. You have to check the complements as well as ESR which will be elevated in SLE and CRP that is also elevated in uh, SLE. Now ESR and CRP these are inflammatory markers so that is why they are elevated in SLE. Then you can do a renal biopsy in patients where there is evidence of nephritis. So first of all, you have to do investigations to see whether it's SLE. Next, you have to do certain tests to see whether the kidneys are involved in SLE. And if the kidneys are involved in patients with SLE, to diagnose the exact pathology, you have to go for a uh, renal biopsy. Now, SLE can affect the kidneys. So this affection of kidneys in SLE could vary uh, in several stages. So it, this uh, severity of kidney involvement in, in SLE could vary from uh, minimal mesangial lupus nephritis to advanced sclerosing nephritis. So now we'll see how it is managed. So if it's mild kidney involvement, it does not require any treatment. But if it is active involvement on the kidney, then the treatment is needed. So what is this treatment? You have to keep the patient immune suppressed. This is done by administering immunosuppressants like steroids, for example, prednisolone, and other immunosuppressants like cyclophosphamides, azithioprines, and uh, certain other uh, mycophenolates. Then you will have to keep blood pressure under control because when the kidneys are damaged, the BP becomes high. So to do that, you will have to give diuretics and antihypertensives. Then dialysis. So if the kidneys have progressed to a stage of irreversible uh, kidney damage, then you will have to do dialysis. If that is unresponsive, you will have to go for a kidney transplantation. So that's about lupus nephritis, how the kidneys are affected in systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune condition. Now, all of 
we know all of us know that uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus is one of the common uh, non-communicable diseases worldwide so when a person has diabetes mellitus it can affect that person's lot of body organs for example the retina of the eye can get damaged you call it diabetic retinopathy the nerves can get damaged you call it diabetic nephropathy then it increases the risk of atherosclerosis so atherosclerosis in the uh, blood vessels supplying the brain can cause uh, ischemic strokes then atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries in the heart can cause uh, acute coronary disease and heart attacks that is myocardial infarction then atherosclerosis in the blood vessels supplying the limbs can reduce the blood flow to the limbs this is called peripheral vascular disease then when people have diabetes even uh, if they hit their feet somewhere and or if something um, if some small injury occurs to their uh, feet since there is loss of sensation there's numbness in the feet they will not feel that so then even the slightest wound can grow to cause secondary bacterial infection this is diabetic foot and at the same time diabetes affects the kidney so this kidney damage caused by diabetes is called diabetic nephropathy so next we are going to discuss about this diabetic nephropathy that is how the kidneys are damaged in diabetes mellitus so diabetes mellitus can cause damage to the kidney so it is one of the most common causes for chronic kidney disease in USA as well as in other Western countries now it can cause a lot of damage long-term damage to the kidney which increases their uh, mortality that is the death rate as well as morbidity yes so this is diagnosed by doing certain urine tests to detect proteins in urine so now this we'll see the etiology so the exact etiology is not known but these are the postulated mechanisms these are the postulated mechanisms they have come up with to show how diabetes damages the kidney so they think hyperglycemia that is increased blood glucose increased amount of glycosylated products in blood and uh, activation of cytokines all these can uh, all these uh, cause damage to the kidney in diabetes mellitus so now we'll see how it is diagnosed so diagnosis is based on clinical history that is symptoms physical examination findings that is signs and then diagnostic assessments so what are the signs and symptoms so there will be passing of foamy frothy urine that is due to proteinuria then there will be this proteinuria is due to diabetes mellitus and there is no other detectable cause for proteinuria that is why we say otherwise unexplained proteinuria then there will be associated other organ damages for example damage to the retina in the eye there will be hypoalbuminemia because the person loses proteins in urine albumin in urine so this leads to edema then there will be associated other complications like coronary artery disease hypertension and peripheral vascular disease reduced blood flow to the limbs now this protein excretion helps in diagnosing diabetic diabetic nephropathy so here what happens is the person will have proteinuria with protein excretion more than 300 milligrams per day on two occasions two three to six months apart so that is how you diagnose uh, kidney damage in diabetes apart from that if you do uh, check for GFR glomerular filtration rate you will see it is reduced and at the same time 
blood pressure if you monitor you will see it is increased so what are the assessments the diagnostic tests 24 hour urine for urea creatinine protein and glucose so it will show glucose positive in a normal person blood does uh, urine does not contain glucose but here glucose is present proteinuria present in a normal person the protein excretion is either minim mm, nil or it is very low but here the protein excretion is high then microscopic urine analysis that is ufr and then you have to do a renal ultrasound scan to see the kidney size any obstructions and uh, finally if the diagnosis is doubtful or if the patient presents with an atypical presentation of kidney damage or if any other kidney disease is also suspected then you will have to go for a renal biopsy so how are the patients managed the main thing is you have to keep the blood glucose level under control because in diabetes mellitus the problem is the blood glucose is high why either because the kidneys are not producing enough amounts of insulin or because the body tissues are not responding to the secreted insulin so whichever the way if diabetes has occurred you have to keep the blood glucose level under control at the same time you have to manage hypertension you have to assess the patient's vitamin d and parathermone levels because the active form of vitamin d is produced in the kidney so when the kidneys are damaged the kidney becomes unable to produce this vitamin d so this uh, now vitamin d is important to maintain blood calcium level so therefore in patients with kidney damage in stage 3 kidney disease uh, for onwards you have to give vitamin d and calcium supplements to the patients then you may have to go for depending on the stage of kidney damage if it's uh, progressing further into a severe stage you will have to go for dialysis so it could be hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis and if it's unresponsive the treatment option would be to go for a kidney transplant and at the same time you should consider dietary changes for example you have to restrict proteins to 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram of body weight per day because the kidneys are damaged already they can't handle their proteins all the most of the proteins that are taken into the body are excreted in urine so you have to restrict the proteins and at the same time the phosphorus and the potassium levels have to be restricted so that is about diabetic nephropathy how the kidneys are damaged in diabetes mellitus so now we'll see hypertension now when there's persistently elevated blood pressure that is called hypertension so when there's hypertension it can uh, make your dilated blood vessels in the brain to rupture causing hemorrhagic strokes it can cause heart attacks in the heart and at the same time it can damage the blood vessels it can make blood vessels to rupture and another complication of hypertension is the damage to the kidneys so when the kidneys are damaged due to hypertension that is called hypertensive nephropathy or hypertensive renal disease so hypertension can cause kidney damage with or without diabetes because most of the time diabetes and hypertension they go hand in hand but uh, in hypertension in patients with hypertension even without diabetes the kidneys can get damaged so there are some factors that can increase or worsen the hypertension in uh, people so these are blood volume hormone levels like parathermone erythropoietin central nervous system activity then vasoactive substances like prost uh, prostaglandins and uh, nitric oxides then activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system and other uh, kidney and blood vessel diseases so these are all conditions that can 
versus hypertension. So now we'll see what happens to the kidneys when there's hypertension. So when there's long-term uncontrolled hypertension or high blood pressure, what happens is the blood, the, uh, the pressure in the blood that enters into the glomerulus also increases. So inside the glomerulus, the pressure, when it is increased, it causes damage to the glomerulus. So then the glomerulus becomes unable to perform its filtration in a normal way. So all the proteins will get filtered in urine, causing proteinuria. So that is why there is albuminuria in patients with hypertensive nephropathy. That's the first sign. Gradually, the proteinuria can progress further. Then the kidneys become further damaged. So in that case, the prognosis is very poor. So how is it managed? You have to control hypertension. To do that, you have to give antihypertensives. So what are these antihypertensives? Drugs like AFE inhibitors, that is antitensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors, antitensin receptor blockers, all of them, they block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, RAAS, which I have told you before, uh, is, a, is one thing that can aggravate uh, hypertension. Then you have to give diuretics like thiazides to patients in chronic kidney disease stage 1 to stage 3. Now depending on GFR, chronic kidney disease are of 5 stages. So for patients with chronic kidney disease stage 1 to stage 3, you have to administer thiazide diuretics. For patients with chronic kidney disease stage 4 and 5, you have to administer loop diuretics. Then calcium channel blockers, aldosterone antagonists, these are all antihypertensive drugs. Apart from that, certain lifestyle modifications are also required. What are these lifestyle modifications? You have to modify the patient's diet. This is called DASH dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So what is that diet? More fruits and vegetables, low fat milk products, lean meat, that is fish. You should avoid uh, red meat and high fat containing meat. And you have to restrict animal fats. And at the same time, you have to cut down the salt and reduce alcohol consumption. So in today's topic, we have been discussing about some renal disorders. So thank you very much for listening.